Okay, so um, I'm paranoid of the voice of God, so I'm going to be dashing through this presentation. Um, <laughs> sorry there, but... Uh, so, so this is, uh, if you haven't quite captured the power of cryptocurrency, I th hopefully this project will sum it up. A lot of people think it's used for nefarious uses, but actually they're now funding scientific um, purposes, scientific projects, they're funding charities all over the world, uh, and Dash decided back in the, uh, in the springtime to, to, to fund this project. And what is this project about? Well, John gave a great description of what you can do with the current genomes. You can do a lot. However, if you look around other plant genomes that have um, much, lar or much smaller economic impact than cannabis, their genomes are in much better shape than ours. Uh, the cannabis genome right now is in, is in horrible shape compared to these things, and it does create some artifacts. Philippe showed some artifacts where you try and replicate markers and the primers fall in SNPs and it, it doesn't re reproduce. And we've seen this with a lot of the vendors um, uh, su supplying sequencing services as well, that the things just don't fully reproduce lab to lab. And we, we got to change that. And, and the best way to change that uh, is to actually um, sequence the genome to a quality of at least what the Human Genome Project had back in 2001. And the metric back then was to get to about 500 KB N50. What that means is the average length of the sequence contig in the assembly was about 500 thousand letters. This is not perfect. This is, uh, we want chromosomes that are hundreds of millions of bases long that are completely contiguous and completely phased, but this is the best we could do back then. Nowadays, I think you'll find the hurdle rate for a good genome, people will say, is if you're in the megabase club. They want this N50 number to be north of a million bases, uh, and I'm going to show you how we pulled this off on the cannabis genome. So. There are several reasons to do this that John touched on. I won't go, go very long. Uh, we want marker-assisted selection. We want accelerated breeding. We want reliable SNP chips, which I don't think you can get off the existing references. Uh, and we, we want to do this on as many genomes as possible, not just any one sort of victory genome. We want a pan genome. We want type 1 genomes, type 2 genomes, type 3 genomes, type 4, type 5, you name it, hemp lines. We really want 12 really powerfully done uh, genomes to make sense of, of what's going on. Uh, now, some, some terminology here, uh, you're probably used to hearing about contigs. This is what a normal assembly turns into, a couple hundred thousand of these, and we really want to get it into chromosomes like this. And there's a technologies from Phase Genomics and PacBio that help do this that we'll touch on. Uh, but this is really important for you to understand where those chromosomes came from, like if they're in certain organelles or if they're in certain microbes that often contaminate genome assemblies. Um, so we started off sequencing a Jamaican lion strain, and this was a strain that uh, I selected mainly because it had some impact on my father. He was using type 2 strains, uh, but there was also some controversy over IP, and we figured, let's see if we can shed some light on that. And I also like teasing uh, Mark Lewis once in a while and, and trolling him a little bit, so I decided, ah, let's sequence something that, that he may have bred. Um, I think this is, actually dates back to 2007. Uh, and there's some awards that won, and it is a uh, type 2 plant, and it looks as if it is uh, beta carotheline dominant, a little bit of myrcene in there as well. Uh, these might vary based on conditions. This is all grown in a hydro to get rid of microbes, or at least to limit the microbes. Uh, but you can see the, the, uh, the reports down here in terms of the, the it's about a 2 to 1 uh, uh, CBD to THC line. So um, how did we do this? Well, Dash, as, as, as Chuck just described, consists of these master node owners that are all over the world that vote on how to spend their treasury. And you submit them proposals, and they decide, will this help us improve our network? And they're interested in solving the banking problem in the cannabis industry, and they saw this conference, and they saw this genome, and said, let's do it. Let's build the best reference in the world, and then we can maybe even build a seed-to-sale tracking system that is forensic uh, in quality. Uh, so they voted on this in, uh, in June 3rd, and this is what's crazy about the process, is you submit the, the grant application, we probably submitted it a week before the deadline, and, and by, by a week later, we had Dash in our bank ready to spend, uh, and we were able to kick the project off. Uh, so this is the summertime. Uh, June 3rd, we started UPCR screening for type 2 plants. Uh, this is a little color metric assay we have that can tell you whether it's type 1, 2, or 3. Uh, we all then went into Illumina sequencing to screen for heterozygosity, to pick a plant that had the, the less of that, because that would be better to sequence your, as a first genome. And then we got to go back to these old school t tools of actually doing uh, pulse field gel electrophoresis to get high molecular weight DNA. This is really critical. Uh, to get DNA as long as possible, because the read lengths we have now in these single molecule sequencers can actually get out to 50 to 100,000 bases. 
Uh, and so we chose to do this on the Pacific Biosciences platform because it had the highest accuracy. There are some other nanopores out there that have longer reads, but the accuracy right now, uh, when we played around with that last year at CanMed, we couldn't get those assemblies to gel. So we turned back to PacBio and looked for higher accuracy reads and fed it DNA that could actually get us these 32,000 base pair reads. And we assembled this by August 3rd and put it public at about a 650 KB and 50. So we beat the Human Genome Project uh, draft, I should say, in a matter of a couple months, 60 days, from getting funded to putting it public. Uh, and this isn't the end of the story. Um, we then decided to team up with Phase Genomics to turn this thing into a perfection genome. Uh, and what these folks do is they use something called chromatin capture, uh, which basically cross-links the proteins that are attached to the DNA, and it tends to mostly do that to uh, inter uh, interchromosomally. So you don't get chromosome to chromosome cross-links as much as you get neighboring DNA cross-links. And so what you can get from this technology are pieces of DNA sequence that are millions of bases apart, but are on the same chromosome, and then you can order up all your chromosomes into pretty pictures. Uh, so we did 600 million high C reads like this on Illumina to, uh, to get the high C data together, threw it into an assembly, and we ended up with a 5.4 megabase N50 genome. Uh, still not perfect, but, but uh, you know, we're up above the megabase club. Uh, but we realized, you know what, we really want to get this into like the 50 megabase range so that we have full chromosomes that are touching and we can phase the genome. Uh, so we went back and did more packed biosequencing on their latest chemistry. It's a version 6 chemistry that does 42,000 base pair reads, and I think it can do longer. This is probably limited on the type and the quality of DNA we gave them uh, and, and gave the laboratory that was doing this. Uh, the, 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 you really need to get that DNA as long as you can uh, so that you can maximize the, the throughput on these, on these systems. So this went into another assembly, a Falcon assembly, and this raw assembly, unscaffolded without any of the high C data trying to glue the contigs together, came out at three times this one megabase uh, club, right? We're at 3.7 megabases of just the pack bio data alone, and that is fantastic. To give you some perspective uh, on where that is, uh, in, in a sl slide or two, she where all the historical assemblies were. And then, of course, we quickly uploaded this into a preprint server because our funding cycle was ending by the end of October, and we really wanted to have the chapter closed on starting of funding to end of funding. We're going to have a, 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 a preprint out that re represents all this data. Um, so what are these platforms? Um, Sarah gave a great talk in the other hallway on what Pacific Biosciences is. These are single molecule sequencers. So that trace you see up there is actually a single molecule going through a zero mode waveguide with a polymerase that's putting in fluorescently labeled nucleotides and you are watching a movie of a polymerase replicating DNA at a single molecule level. It's absolutely mind blowing Star Trek stuff. Uh, and they can do millions of these wells at a time, which is, which is, which is fascinating. And then the other one is this, this high C approach that phase genomics was, was doing. Uh, and what this does is it really gives you three-dimensional structures of the genome, because their genome is not these perfect, beautiful, linear chromosomes. It's actually a big Gordian knot. Uh, and when you cross-link that, you end up cross-linking certain DNA into certain compartments of cells, like the mitochondrial DNA ends up in one place and the chloroplast ends up in another. And then all of the, uh, the, um, the microbial contaminations end up cross-linked in their own buckets because they have, they have nucleuses and other cell walls that are kind of constraining them. So this helps partition cells into the buckets that the DNA actually exists in inside the cell so you can do a much more complete uh, and thorough assembly. Um, so this is one of the first ones uh, that we did, and the most, I think the most remarkable thing about this technique is that you don't need high molecular weight DNA to do this. You take the tissue and you just cross-link it with formaldehyde, uh, and then you chop the DNA up, and once it's cross-linked, you know, those huge loops of megabases apart get cut, and you ligate them, and you're effectively reading the ends of these large loops of DNA, and you end up building these maps. And so what the map that you have here is a contact map. It's one of the earliest ones that we have. So it, Typically, you want to see a really bright line in the middle, and we're not completely getting that yet with cannabis because of the, the repeat content in it, but it is bucketing now into 10 nice chromosomes, which is what we want to see. We want to see chromosome one through chromosome, uh, through all the way through the X and Y chromosomes as well, and we want to see two of them, all right, because the cannabis is diploid most of the time, uh, and that's the next phase that we have to do, no pun intended, is we have to then take this diploid genome and split it into the two maternal and paternal chromosomes for every one of them and then organize them. Um, okay, so just put the brakes on here and uh, look at what types of assemblies we traditionally have. So back in 2001, John's group and our group played around with assembling uh, these, some of these genomes with Illumina data, and they ended up in hundreds of thousands of pieces, and the average contig size was like around 3,000 bases, okay? Uh, that's, that's very small uh, contig size when you consider the human genome you know, declared victory uh, on a draft at 500,000 bases. 
And then many other people started shipping in. Steep Hill put out a really nice assembly that, that then bumped this number up. Uh, likewise, Phylos put one in there, and I think the, the N50 number got up to 159 KB. That was the longest, uh, most contiguous assembly, and it was on Canatonic, which was a type 3 strain. Uh, so we weren't getting much information out of the THC genetics from that strain, but it was still giving us great insight into maybe the CBD genetics. Uh, so then we jumped on to Jamaican Lion and started pumping these numbers up into the 648 region and the 665 region with just the pack bio assembly alone. And then when, they t when, they, when we topped this off with version 6 chemistry, these numbers all jumped to 3.7 megabase uh, N50 results. So it's really, we're really talking about thousands of fold improvement over contiguity from where we started in 2011 to what we have, what we have today. Um, so very fast response uh, working with, with cryptocurrency folks. They, 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 they move very quickly and uh, it, it really helps to, to get the, public, the data out there uh, publicly. Uh, we did play around with trying to figure out some aspects of this genome with the existing assemblies we had. We published a preprint that we never really converted into a paper because it just opened up this onion uh, of confusion once we did this. We, we, did, we did PCR amplification of THC synthase with two different primer sets, and some primer sets that were described in the literature from a group named uh, from the Onofre paper were sitting right inside the gene. So when they amplified this, they w the primers were sitting on the start and stop codon, and they're a little bit blind to the variation in the start and the stop codons, and that's going to mean something in a minute. Uh, but you'll see when we amplify with those Onofre primers, we amplify a lot of copies, and we don't know where they are in the genome. We just amplify them and sequence them, and we know that they're unique copies because they have high, high confidence polymorphisms between them. But we don't know the order of them in the genome, and we don't know where they go in the genome, and we don't necessarily know if they're fully active in, in the genome. We just saw there's a lot of those copies. We then backed those primers out to amplify with more unique regions in the genome, and we started getting much fewer genes that were coming through, and the ones that were coming through seemed to all be full length. There weren't any stop codons in them, and they looked as if they were really good THC synthase um, contigs. Now, when you get a good genome reference, this is what happens, is they all show up in a tandem array. So interestingly enough, THC synthase has replicated itself almost like a, it's kind of skidded across the genome. Uh, and so here's one region, one contig that has five different copies of THC synthase, but they're all mutated substantially. Uh, in fact, I don't even know if we want to call some of these THC synthase because they're mutated probably, uh, they're probably only 85 percent identity. And then likewise, you can look at another contig that is the one that contains cannabichromine synthase. Now we know that this thing actually is four tandem copies, about 30 or 40 KB apart. And you probably can't see this, but there are some mutations in the, in the three prime end and the five prime end that change the amino acid structure such that primers probably missed this in the past because they would have been placed on those sequences. Um, there happens to be two more copies of this in other, another contig in the genome that's now been linked by the HiC data. So there's actually six copies of this thing, and they're all slightly diverged, and we don't know if they fold at the same rate or if they maybe fold some of the other rare cannabinoids. That These need to be cloned and expressed, and a lot of the work that John's done on this gene needs to be repeated with maybe some of these, not some of these variants. Um, this is how many we're finding uh, that have at least 80 percent identity. There's 30 different DNA sequences, and this is a cladogram of them and the scaffolds that they're sitting on in the genome. Uh, and so we can see there's a lot of cannabinoid diversity, cannabinoid synthase diversity. Uh, and then if you, if you kind of whittle those down and say, well, which ones are really full length and possibly functional? Because some of these are so mutated, maybe they're just, uh, they're just pseudogenes. And um, we get down to a, a, about 18 of these different THC synthase genes that look like they're, they, they possibly could be in, actually encode for something that's full length. Don't know what they do. We need to be teaming up with people that can probably clone these, express them, and, and, and get more information on, on their functionality. Now, in terms of assay development, as Philippe was touching on, this is what we were dealing with before, is that this is a mapping to the references that were made back in 2011. And if you're not careful when you map to these genomes, uh, these blue reads are paired reads. That means they're Illumina reads where you have a forward and reverse read, and they both map to the genome. The thing highlights it blue. Red and green are ones where we can only map one of the reads to the genome and not the other, and so something's wrong, and those ones you should always kind of discount as whether or not you should trust them. But even with these blue ones, you can see uh, paired reads, there are four SNPs in here that probably don't really exist. And what this is, when you map these same reads to Jamaican lion, you see that those reads then map to those other genes that we just found that are tandem. And so it cleans up a lot of your mapping, it cleans up a lot of your polymorphism discovery, uh, and now we have a reference where we can actually maybe go ahead and make a SNP chip out of this and not be confusing all the signals that, that, uh, that we might get out of the chip. 
So um, phase genomics then uh, stepped into this to try and phase the genome, which is using this high c stuff to peel apart the maternal and paternal uh, haplotypes so that we can have a perfectly phased genome. Uh, and when they run this through a BUSCO analysis, I'm sorry, not a BUSCO, but a, this is a, a QUAST analysis. It looks at how many pieces of the genome you have. It's, it's up in the 800 range there. Uh, and you can see the N50 numbers are getting closer to 5.4 megabases. Uh, the more complete genomes, a little bit more AT rich. Um, I don't have time to go into this. We are publishing this on Dash, and what that means is we're using an incentivized review system to speed it up. Uh, we select three, three reviewers. We end up putting out a cryptocurrency bounty for doing the review, uh, and everything, every communication they do ends up getting hashed onto the blockchain, so it's completely censorship resistant uh, and transparent. Um, so the phasing stuff is tough, right? This is uh, what a typical genome should look like, is it should have two different copies uh, of, this, uh, of this genome. And then what typically happens is genomes get collapsed. If they're not, if they're really homozygous like humans, they get collapsed into one copy. They can't discern the maternal from the paternal because there's only a snip every hundred bases. Three or every thousand bases. Um, we want to, we want to tease those apart. And you do this with a program called Purge Haplotigs, which looks for coverage differences among the contigs, rips the ones that are high out of the picture. And then you can begin to zip these things into even better maps than we have here. Uh, and if you add in bigger data from PacBio, um, these things turn into this mess. Now, this is actually not a mess. It looks like a mess for you, but what actually we're seeing here is uh, the numbers that popped out of this were 75 megabase N50 contigs. This means we have perfect chromosomes uh, that are all sorted. Now, there might be a couple gaps in between the scaffolding from high C, which we can fill with a couple other programs that they're recommending, like Polar Star and, and, uh, and another tool that helps to connect those. I think it's called PB Jelly. Um, and we're in that process right now to just now polish these things and fill the gaps, but I think it's uh, safe to say that we now have uh, a genome that is better than most of the other agricultural crops out there. Um, and this is just more statistics I won't bore you with, but what the future is going to hold is we have a cross of this going on so we can get a trio. Uh, it's with its brother. And um, what we're going to do in the future is a lot more methylation sequence, a lot more RNA sequencing, uh, and we're going to do some more trio work and maybe build some, um, some really powerful SNP chips. So I want to thank all these people involved. There's a lot of volunteers that jumped into this project and made this work, and I should leave some time for a question or two. Thanks. Please come up to the mics and ask any questions. Hey, Kevin. Uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for the talk. Um, I do have a question. You mentioned the, uh, the repeats on, on the THC and the cannabinoid synthase, and I think uh, you probably saw a lot on uh, Turpin synthesis. Can you co comment a little bit on, on the organization? Oh, thank you for bringing that up. So um, we've done a little bit of, of looking into the terpene synthase genes as well. You, to be honest, um, Luca and, uh, and uh, Keith Allen at Steep Hill have been digging into that a little bit more. We've got a, kind of a little community here that I know that you're involved with that are they're staring down at that. They're remapping all of John's RNA sequencing data onto the new assemblies. And the terpene synthase cluster is even bigger. Uh, there's many more of those to, to work through. Fantastic. Thanks. I, this, I'm kind of new to this. Does this mean anything of value can be sold or distributed to anybody or everybody? Um, are you referring to the blockchain side of this or, or the cannabis sequencing side of this? Like if I have a photograph of Jimi Hendrix, does that mean it can be somehow quantified into some massive uh, distribution or... So there, there, are, uh, there are things going on on the Ethereum network where people will get art uh, and hash it onto Ethereum and you can get certain number of digital copies that are verifiable so that that art is effectively uh, scarce digitally, if you will. Um, and there's some unique attributes to the music industry that, that plays a role in, but I think I'm getting, uh, I'm, I'm getting uh, the god light coming up on me over here. <laughs> So I think with this, we're, we're going to turn this over into more Q&A uh, with the panel to talk about uh, medicinal cannabis, and I would like to invite all of our panelists up for this, uh, this event. <laughs>